Well, welcome everyone to what is our very first interview with one of our guests as part of the Department of International Relations at the ANU's uh, regular seminar series. My name's Ben Zala and today I'm absolutely honoured to have with me Professor Mark Beeson from the University of Western Australia. So thanks for coming along, Mark. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Not at all. So later on this afternoon, you're going to be giving a, a seminar here about uh, the Australia-US alliance. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if I could just ask you, to begin with, as someone who's worked for many years on uh, what you might broadly call the international relations of the Asia-Pacific, economy, finance, security, various issues, what is it that's brought you to looking at alliances and the, the US-Australia alliance specifically? Uh, well, I, I, my work originally was uh, centred on the international political economy of East Asia, and so uh, I had a, a, an interest in the development of the East Asian region historically, and one of the things that became increasingly apparent to me was that you couldn't understand anything, including really pivotal events like the so-called East Asian miracle and the amazing industrialization of the entire region. You couldn't understand any of that without thinking about the wider geopolitical context in which all of this happened. And whatever you think about uh, American hegemony in inverted commas, uh, it clearly had some very positive effects in terms of allowing certain processes of industrialization to happen uh, in the places and at the speed that they did. So that was an important thing uh, for me to kind of think about in making sense of some of my former interests and putting them in a wider kind of context. So that began to spark an interest in the overall security picture. And so I started reading some of the security literature in a more serious kind of way than I had done in the past. Uh, and I have to say that I found it a fairly dispiriting and underwhelming experience <laughs> often. Uh, and that got some of the stuff is good and, mm. and uh, it does give you a really rich idea of the importance of geopolitics, but some of the narrower security questions were a bit dull, to be frank, I found, anyway. But I started reading this diligently and read the uh, Alliance literature as well. And I found that even more underwhelming, yeah. to be honest. Uh, but it, it sparked an interest and uh, that got me interested uh, in a roundabout way in Australia's right. uh, foreign policy and position. And the lack of uh, debate about the sorts of... Uh, options and possibilities that were open to a country like Australia. My first tentative dipping of a toe into this kind of water was I wrote a piece in uh, 2003 which was just before the, uh, or it was written before the Iraq mm. invasion happened and I tentatively pointed out that maybe this wasn't actually in Australia's national interest and possibly wasn't such a great idea. And uh, if I do say so myself, that doesn't look like a bad position <laughs> to have taken at the time. and. Uh, and that kind of reinforced my uh, perception that uh, there wasn't enough debate about some of these issues uh, ahead of time, as it were. And there was just a kind of overwhelming conventional wisdom that nobody really criticised, and uh, that I would make a kind of you know small contribution mm -hmm. to this debate. And so, tell me in a, a sort of contemporary setting, then um, there's probably a little bit more discussion around uh, some of the the costs associated with the the U.S. alliance within Australia. Uh, post the election of one Donald J. Trump. Indeed. So tell me, what do you think Trump, what sort of challenges to the Australian-American alliance does Trump and the Trump administration pose? Well, I think the word to use about Donald Trump is unpredictable and uh, nobody quite knows what he's going to do next, I think including himself, mm -hmm. so that's a bit of a problem. I think for other countries around the world generally, whether they're allies of the United States or not, this presents really difficult challenges and problems because nobody knows exactly what the most powerful country in the world is likely to do at any particular moment on any particular set of issues that you care to nominate, mm. uh, including security issues but lots of other things as well obviously. So it's a particular challenge for a country like Australia it seems to me because we have a formal alliance relationship with the United States and historically Australian policy has been based on the idea that we need to kind of reinforce this relationship and demonstrate uh, that we are a credible alliance partner who can be relied on by the United States. Now, whatever the merits of that position are, and I think there's this kind of separate debate about you know, what Australia gets from that and how important it is these days and vital to national security, there's a sort of separate debate about that. But I think the, the thing that the Trump administration and Donald Trump himself particularly highlights is the fact that it makes a difference who's in the White House mm -hmm. at any particular time. 
Uh, and when you uh, give the proverbial blank check to the leadership of the United States, no matter who it may be, and no matter what kind of policy framework they may be enunciating, then you find yourself kind of locked into this. And the point about my referring back to the Iraq war, you would have thought that given what a fiasco that turned out to be, and I don't think too many people, there are a few exceptions, but I don't think too many people are really arguing that that was a good idea mm. in retrospect. And I think it destabilised the entire Middle East region, and we're all kind of living with the consequences yeah. of that to this day. So that wasn't a good idea. And uh, I would have thought that that should have triggered a more serious debate about the costs and benefits of being in that kind of relationship where we found ourselves almost being obliged, particularly when somebody like John Howard's in office, to go along with certain policy ideas that the Americans were putting forward. So, so maybe that should have given us pause for thought, mm -hmm. but interestingly, uh, Malcolm Turnbull seems to be repeating exactly the same kind of behaviour in some ways rushing over to ingratiate himself with the new American administration, despite some of the rhetoric, despite Trump advocating what he describes as a more kind of trans, or other people have described as a more transactional foreign policy and expecting allies to pay their way and take more responsibility for their own security. So a whole series of signals have been sent by the Trump administration that ought to be giving allies pause for thought and to reconsider in a very serious way the nature of their relationship and the nature of the obligations of that they judge that that seems to uh, imply and yet we've had precious little debate about any of that so at the very least you know my modest contribution to this uh, lack of debate is to encourage the idea that there should be a debate and mm -hmm. to be fair uh, I think there has been some movement in this area and a number of people like Paul Keating, Bob Carr and others are now coming out with statements about uh, the need for taking a more independent yeah. uh, stance on foreign policy, and that's welcome. It's a bit overdue, uh, and it would have been interesting if they thought about some of these issues while they actually had a chance to make a difference, mm -hmm. i.e. when they were in power. And I think one of the dispiriting and discouraging things about Australian foreign policy is that people don't actually seem to take... Uh, the opportunity to do something about it when they are actually in office mm -hmm. and it's always after they leave office and apparently freed of the cares and responsibilities that go with that uh, that they feel able to say something so it mm -hmm. kind of begs the question well, what's the point of being in office if you yeah. aren't capable of actually thinking independently or critically at the time when you can actually do something about it. Which is interesting isn't it that you've got a, a former foreign minister former Prime Minister and Malcolm Fraser, of course. Another yes, of former course. Prime yep. Minister. Yep. They've probably yep. been the ones who've had the most to say on this idea Indeed. of being more autonomous and foreign policy and so forth. So where do you, what's your hunch of where this comes from then? Why is it that in the mainstream Australian debate, in the media and in policy circles and think tanks and so forth, why are we so reluctant to have an honest discussion about the costs and not necessarily saying that, that the benefits outweigh the costs, but just not acknowledging that there are costs at all to this alliance. Yeah, I think one, there's a, there's a you know, long and complex uh, explanation to this thing, and part of it's about history, part of it's about uh, a certain degree of path dependency, and there are powerful institutions, uh, formal and informal, that uh, encourage a certain way of thinking about uh, particular sorts of issues. And people talk about strategic culture as mm -hmm. one way of trying to explain uh, the predominance of certain ideas and there's a certain group think about th these kinds of things I think that exists amongst serious policy analysts, mm -hmm. analysts. and I think one of the one of the uh, reasons that people don't buy into this kind of debate from uh, different kinds of perspectives is because they don't want to appear foolish, non-serious, uh, intellectually uh, not up to speed with the kind of serious issues and approaches that underlie some of the conventional wisdom about these things. And so you stick your head above the parapet mm -hmm. at your peril because you're likely to be uh, coming for some a lot of criticism or not to, or even worse perhaps, not to be taken seriously Seriously. at all and entirely marginalised from the debate. Right. And I think that's the even more common trait in Australia that certain views are simply not taken seriously mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and there is an overwhelming conventional wisdom among serious types, particularly in Canberra and uh, particularly in this institution, uh, that dominate the debate and have done for years. 
And you know, my response to that would be, I can understand uh, the way that some of these kinds of processes work at a sort of institutional and a discursive sort of level. But my response is, I mean, if these policies were unambiguously working, if we were unambiguously secure, if the world was a more stable, predictable, orderly place, then sure, mm. I'd be quite happy to butt out and not say anything. But clearly, that is not the world that we inhabit. Uh, I think there's pretty good evidence for saying that many of these po policies have not contributed to overall international domestic stability. That's bad enough in itself. But the other point to make, of course, is that they are unbelievably expensive uh, policies to uh, subscribe to. And any other area of public policy comes in for stringent and rigorous critique uh, when anybody suggests jacking up the public spending uh, in that particular area. Defence security is the one area that is always insulated from these processes, no matter how extravagant and uh, checkered the uh, record of spending in that area may be. They're not held to account in the same way that anybody, anybody else is. And on the contrary, their uh, budgets uh, are usually increased, not reduced. So, again, I think there's a a good reason for people, non-specialists like me, yeah. to uh, make a contribution and just say, you know, because I'm not the one who wants to spend whatever it is, you know, 20 million, billion, 20 billion on mm. new submarines or fighter jets or whatever it might be. I'm saying, let's hear the case for the precise use that these uh, new uh, acquisitions are going to be put to and, and the direct contribution they're actually going to make to our long-term security, which is something that's not usually mm -hmm. discussed. As someone who um, you know, is a frequent visitor of and has been a long time scholar of other countries, particularly in the Asia Pacific, who also find themselves in, a, in an alliance relationship with the United States, so the likes of South Korea and Japan and so forth, what's your sense of how these debates are playing out elsewhere? Do you think the Australian debate or lack thereof about the US alliance is mirrored in other allies or are we a bit unique? Uh, I think there are. Oh, there are always distinctive things about Australia from an historical perspective. We're probably closer than most. I think perhaps the closest might be Japan, and I think mm. that for as you know, well-known historical reasons, the debate there has a very distinctive and unique character. I mean, my worry is, and this may strike some viewers of this little video as being hopelessly naive and out of touch with uh, reality, strategic reality, that is. But I, I mean, I take Japan as being a really interesting exemplar of a different way of organising security principles and uh, the basis for public policy more generally in Japan. And they, since the Second World War, for again, for well-known reasons, they haven't spent as much on uh, their own security uh, as other comparable nations. They haven't played the same kind of role in the international system as other countries. Uh, and I think that's been interesting and useful, mm -hmm. if only because it demonstrates that other ways of doing things are in fact possible. Now there's a big question mark about whether it's a good idea for Japan to subordinate itself in quite the way or rely as heavily in quite the way that it has done in the United States, particularly in the Trump era, mm. and that's playing out now. But it could play out with you know, relatively unfortunate consequences if Japan also decides that it needs to be a nuclear power, for example, yeah. or have nuclear weapons of its own, which is uh, a more likely prospect than it was only a few months ago. So mm. there are those kinds of things. My my own view about uh, what might be possible in a different kind of set of circumstances and what might be a different kind of basis for Australian foreign policy is that it's possible to imagine at least that uh, there's a lot of talk about Australia being a middle power in this country mm. and it's usually seen as being a positive thing. In reality it hasn't amounted to much so far, but it could. Uh, and Australia could uh, actually think of aligning itself more closely with uh, countries like South Korea and Japan, other so-called middle powers, with whom it might have quite a lot in common, and with whom it might be able to develop a different kind of agenda, discourse about security, set of security principles that don't mean that each of those countries has to arm itself to the teeth uh, in quite the way that uh, traditional security thinking and practice suggests that they ought mm -hmm. to do. They could do something different and they could encourage a different set of behaviours on the part of the so-called great powers like the United States and of course China. Mm -hmm. uh, some people might think this is hopelessly naive and 
Possibly it is. Uh, it's unlikely at the moment, but it doesn't mean to say that it shouldn't be taken seriously, mm. at least at the, at the level of discourse and thinking about different policy alternatives that might apply to so-called middle powers, uh, because the system that we have at the moment clearly isn't generating unambiguously good security mm. outcomes, so maybe there's a space for thinking about things slightly differently. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, the international system that we live in now, um, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of your work, um, particularly around the time of the Bush Jr. administration and even the beginning of the Obama administration, was focused on this idea of US hegemony, I'm trying to understand the nature of US hegemony and whether it's shifting and changing and so forth. In 2017, under, under Trump, What's the state of US hegemony? Does it still exist? Are we still in a hegemonic order, do you think? Uh, depends how you define it, of course. That's, yeah. the, uh, that's the underlying that's well, the answer. <laughs> we won't go into a huge, lengthy debate about that. But yeah. I think there are elements uh, of American hegemony. I mean, there are some powerful and potentially important and valuable international organisations like the World Bank, the WTO, the IMF, and various other organisations in which historically America's played a very significant role in helping to create and to uh, give them legitimacy and some capacity to act effectively in the world. Now there's a separate debate about whether you think the role of those institutions has been positive or negative. I mean I happen to think that overall, on balance, the influence of American hegemony very broadly conceived in creating a degree of uh, certainly economic stability in the world over time and allowing uh, greater international economic interdependence has been a good thing and I'm a big fan of greater economic interdependence, interdependence. and I think for me the European Union uh, and some of your list listeners or viewers might be flabbergasted by this statement but I think the European Union is the greatest political project and experiment in the history of the world bar none and that's partly uh, emerged as a function of American hegemony. If American hegemony didn't do anything else encouraging the European Union to take off in the first place and pacify Western Europe in a way that's never happened before mm. in human history. Mm. That's not a bad, bad outcome, it seems to me. Now, there are no other aspects of American hegemony broadly conceived, some of the security aspects of that process that are more contentious and potentially open to critique, I think. And, you know, the evidence of what can go wrong with America's overwhelming strategic dominance are pretty clear in the example of Iraq and you know, we may be unfortunately about to see other examples of this happening and that's one of the dangers about Trump that you know what might seem like a good idea uh, next week i.e. bombing North Korea back mm -hmm. into the Stone Age may in the you know on reflection might not seem quite such a great idea mm -hmm. afterwards so I think that's the kind of danger uh, of uh, the continuation of uh, some aspects of American primacy mm. uh, that uh, are potentially worrying. Uh, but I am not, uh, by implication, necessarily advocating that China should replace America or that it's likely to. Or that there, these are really complex and uh, difficult questions, and the relationship between China and the United States is really going to be pivotal mm. for everything that goes on in this century. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The way you describe it in conceptual terms and the, the, the practical implications of how that relationship plays itself out, I mean, that's a, you know, a long mm. and complex explanation of what's going on there. But I think uh, clearly we're in, a, we're in a moment in history where American dominance is not as certain uh, as it was, but there are still important elements of that which uh, have potentially serious consequences for everybody, yeah. I think. Um, maybe just to finish off, I could pick you up on that question of a, you know, potential hegemonic transition or at least um, challenges to US primacy. There's been interesting discussion this year around the whole idea of um, perhaps somewhat unexpectedly China becoming the new sort of champion of, of the free trade order and globalization. No time to change. Absolutely. So no sooner had Trump you know, withdrawn the Americans from the TPP, there's President Xi you know, in Davos at the World Economic Forum giving a, a rousing speech in defense of, of globalization. Uh, and of course we've had the, the conference earlier this year that really kicked off properly um, the One Belt, One Road sort of initiative. So in terms of that, that idea of providing public goods and, and being the holders of this, this globalised order, what do you make of all this? Do you, do you see China as being a, a, a legitimate and um, a possible 
uh, keeper of the flame, as it were, of, of the globalised economic order in the absence of American leadership? Up to a point. Uh, I think uh, it's interesting uh, and revealing that Xi Jinping thinks he can credibly go to somewhere like Davos and make a big speech about being a champion of globalisation and people take him seriously and he kind of wowed the Davos crowd and they loved it. And because it's partly a reflection of how little confidence the globalisation crowd have in Donald Trump to actually maintain America's traditional role as a champion of globalisation, which itself also needs a bit of unpacking as well, obviously. So that's kind of interesting that there has been this uh, repositioning of the two most important countries in the world. I think there is no doubt that all of the things being equal, that China will play a more and more important part in the world simply because of the import, the material importance of the Chinese economy is so important to uh, this region in particular that we're a part of, but the, the world more generally. So it's going to have increasing geoeconomic leverage in the world. The question is what it will do with it and uh, what capacity it actually has to play the kind of role that America rhetorically at least played in underpinning these, you know, the Bretton Woods era mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. I think there's a couple of points I make about it. One is that the Americans never played that role unambiguously and never were always a uh, provider of collective goods. There were times when they privileged American unilateral interests first and foremost and were prepared to pursue them at the expense of the international system. So we have a kind of rosy picture often or an ideological picture of what American hegemony was like often which doesn't always square with the facts. That sort of highlights what China can, cannot do as well I think because uh, China has the potential just because of its economic presence in the global economy in precisely the same way the Americans did after the Second World War to play a, a bigger role and it will have to in some ways. The big question is uh, that the kind of contradictions, there's a bit of Marxist jargon, uh, in the Chinese economy mean that there are limits to what it can do because it has to think about domestic interests in precisely the same way that the Americans have done from time to time as well. And that may limit the kinds of role it can play and limit its willingness to provide collective goods to the international system in terms of freeing up its own currency, allowing its uh, uh, domestic market to be freely accessible, uh, having a hands-off role with state-owned enterprises and uh, abandoning state control over key elements of the Chinese economy. So these kind of questions are still highly uncertain and it's very unclear about whether the Chinese leadership, uh, when we remember it's supposed to be the Communist Party who's in charge, and clearly it is the Communist Party, whether they're communists is another question, uh, but they are in charge and whether they're going to want to relinquish the kind of tight control and influence they still have over ma major aspects of the domestic Chinese economy is a really open-ended question. And I think at this stage uh, the jury is still out, but I think the fact that they can seriously kind of position themselves as now as the kind of champions of globalisation in the absence of American leadership, then that's the really interesting and revealing thing about the times we live in at yeah. the moment. So for Asia-Pacific watchers like yourself, it's it's a great time. Interesting time. So, yes, as they say. Very good. Thank you very much. It's always lovely to have a chat to you. Great to have you here in Canberra, and thanks for coming along. Thanks very much, Ben. You're welcome.